welcome back wizards to another episode of the wizard factory podcast where you subscribe to weekly videos exploring deeper knowledge of the universe and yourself my name is logan hart and i'm brian easterday and we're joined today by daniel cuellar um, who is the founder of peaceful anarchism and the uh the peaceful anarchism facebook page and he also produces many youtube videos as well as dtube uh, he's a practitioner of Eastern healing arts with degrees in acupuncture and Chinese medicinal herbs. Um, and he is a very outspoken anarchist who is uh, also a avid chess player, philosopher, comedian, and now father of two little anarchists. And um, yeah, we're very honored to have you on the show. Welcome, Daniel. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Uh, excited and looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, so we're very excited to have you. So I think a good place to start uh, this interview is on the topic of conscious parenting, because uh, personally, I think that this is one of the most uh, important yet undervalued components of just building an all around good world, a good society, you know. So um, how did you get interested in this topic? So... Before I had my, we had our first child in um, 2010, um, I had no idea what peaceful parenting was. And, um, and actually, I remember having a conversation with my wife at the time before she was pregnant. And, uh, and, and we, I, I said, um, so if our child, um, you know, is out of line or misbehaves, we're going we're gonna to hit him, right? And she's like, yeah, makes sense. And, uh, and, and so I kind of never gave it a second thought. And also actually, interesting enough, before having kids, uh, I would see, you know, school buses come and we, we would reminisce like, oh, our child's going to be on the school bus one day. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of funny how radically we've shifted um, and how, um, you know, how before becoming a parent, you really don't know how you will parent. You know, you really only know once you become a parent. So it's amazing how that shifts. It's like once it's your child, once it's your uh, flesh and blood um, and you have skin in the game, then um, things change. You know, begin to, you begin to re-examine some things. And I, I did anyway. And so um, we had the child and, um, and that's when I started really educating myself. I found Sefa Molyneux, Peaceful Parenting uh, videos, and I, and I was introduced uh, through him uh, about the other things, economics, free markets, um, philosophy, um, anarchism, volunteerism, capitalism. And then I, you know, found other things, Larkin Rose and, um, Blue Rockwell and Tom Woods and all that. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, Stefan Manu really influenced me about peaceful parenting and I took it to heart and it just made sense to me. And, uh, I mean, my childhood, I wouldn't say was a violent childhood. Um, I mean, my parents did, um, physically hit me or yeah uh, occasionally um not a lot as uh maybe other people um yeah and i mean my my wife had a comparably more slightly more uh authoritarian upbringing you know she grew up in communist romania um she was born in 82 and she um she came here in uh, 94 to new york and so she witnessed communism uh falling in 89 and yeah, it's, it's amazing to hear her upbringing, how she came, uh, how she grew up there as compared to mine, you know, growing up in Rockland County, New York, <laughs> as compared to communist Romania, a uh, big yeah. difference, right? In, in terms of parenting. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we tell our kids all the time, right? Now my kids are now uh, seven and nine, seven-year-old girl, nine-year-old boy. And we tell them all the time that, you know, the... Uh, opportunities that you have available to you right now especially because you're homeschooled <laughs> that's, that's especially um but also the the fact that you know we are consciously peaceful parenting we don't we don't spank we don't um punish you know really and we um yeah i try to reason with my kids you know i explain things and i i don't i try to talk down to them i i, I encourage their questions i um i actually love the idea of of paying kids instead of like 
giving allowance, you know, that uh, maybe most of us, I don't know. I think I got allowance for doing nothing every week. I don't know if you guys did, but um, I didn't like that. I don't like that idea because it's like, it's like just giving them money for nothing. Right. And so it's breeding that entitlement. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. You, like could, pay me. you could say that. Yeah. And so if, if we were going to give them money, might as well um, have them work for it and earn it. Right. So, so they have been working for me, um, teach, helping me teach my chess classes for the past, uh, I'd say since last year, maybe like in the fall. Yeah. Maybe in the fall since last year. Um, and, if, and I tell them if they do a good job in helping me teach the kids and um, if they're professional and if they, um, you know, sometimes my kids get, kids get crazy in my chess classes and I say, well, if you help me control them, help me manage them and don't contribute to the craziness, you know, you be a professional, I'll pay you $5 per class. So that's why I paid them $5 per class for each of them. And, uh, and it's very lucrative for them. <laughs> and they love it. <laughs> and, I, and I love telling people that I, uh, I support child labor. <laughs> because <laughs> because funny. it instills um, professionalism, work ethic, you know, learning right. how to please customers. Um, and just um, understanding that <clears throat> it doesn't have to be money, but just value is derived from work. You know, yeah. you create, we create value through our actions, right? Yes. And so to just give children something, especially money for nothing. Um, they it, won't it, value it. Yeah, they won't value it. And, and they're going to grow up uh, and eventually, you know, they will work. And so it, why not get them used to that idea of, of having to work for their money? So, so yeah, I definitely incorporate that into it. And um, yeah, peaceful parenting. I mean, I have a lot of videos on peaceful parenting, a lot of posts I do, a lot of writing, um, my blog posts, my articles um, on peaceful parenting. It's, it's really a big part of what I do. Uh, mm -hmm. I talk about that a lot, and, you know, anti-circumcision and all this mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it really is such an important area to focus on that I think, you know, a lot of people kind of overlook, but it's, you know, so much of our society and, you know, the behavior people have, like toxic behavior people have as adults comes from a place of being traumatized as a child. So bringing that conscious parenting, you know, uh, is so much better for society as a whole. Like if you can have a generation of children who are raised to be aware and to actually understand uh, right from wrong and, you know, how to actually work for things to create value. Uh, that that's going to create a lot of change in the world. Uh, you know, and that, and that's really the only way to go about it. It's, it's a lot easier to teach children the right way than to try to undo a lot of programming that adults already have ingrained in them, especially if they're, you know, a lot older, they've been set in their ways for a long time. It, it, there's a, you know, there's a lot more ego in the way that you have to get past where the, the you know, children are like a sponge. They, they want to learn, they want to know how to do things. So if we really, you know, take the time to understand, especially in those formative years, those first seven years of, you know, laying a proper programming in there for children that actually know how to think for themselves and they want to question. They, they don't see learning as a punishment or something that's forced on them, but rather something that that's, that's part of life and it's enjoyable to do. That's how you create, you know, people who understand freedom and will actually want to learn and question and, you know, make the changes in society that we, we would all like to see happen to create a freer world. Right. Very well said. And um, I love Danilo that you brought up uh, a few of those things. We've actually done an episode on some of these topics uh, called the wound healing, the wounded warrior uh, that touches on spanking and circumcision, but we're very happy to revisit these things because it is very, very important. And, um, you know, I, th I think things like spanking, can really lead to like pave the way for so many other problems that, that come forth in, in the, uh, the aggregate sort of psychic weather and how things are playing out because it's all coming back to what I, you know, what I, what I would label as flat out um, trauma based mind control. Spanking is trauma based mind control. <laughs> and, um, and then that is going to play out in unconscious ways and especially things like accepting the gaslighting that is statism, 
that we're just these reckless animals that we need to be controlled and governed and, and forced into obedience. Otherwise, we would destroy ourselves and, and all this kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's just fundamentally important to continue to revisit all of the things that we sort of take for granted or just accept as normal or just the way things are done and really take a look at what, what it actually is doing and, and what is playing out because of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, going along circumcision, uh, is, uh, for boys is, um, you know, piercing the ears of girls, uh, when they're babies, right. With, before they can consent. Right. And, uh, and so that's something we didn't do with our, with our daughter either. And what's interesting is that, um, my daughter is very, um, she's a very strong girl. You know, she, um, she doesn't shy away from difficult situations or pain or something that's hard. She, uh, she does a lot of things like ballet, tap dance and gymnastics. And, and, uh, she's very athletic. She's very strong and she's very, and she's very good at chess. Also, they're both, they both play chess and they're both pretty Ooh. equal, even though she's two years younger, which is pretty amazing. Um, but one thing that she wanted early, maybe, I think she was maybe six years old, is uh, her ears pierced. She really wanted her ears pierced badly, right? And and I, I was like, are you sure? Are you sure you want this? this you know, it's, it's painful. It's not comfortable. She's like, yes, I want it. I want it. And so we went to an ear piercing place, uh, at, I guess a tattoo parlor, and they did it there. And and he did one side, and it was very painful. Well, well it was it was painful enough that she, was, she started to cry, right? She started tearing. And I'm like, all right, we don't have to do the other one. It's okay. And she's like, no. I want the other one. <laughs> wow. So That's it's amazing, so you know? <laughs> so I was, uh, I was amazed at her, uh, her, her fortitude or determination in doing something. Once she sets her mind to it, like there's no going back. She wants to do it. And yeah, so that, I'm proud of her. Yeah, good. That kind of brings up some, re, um, you know, like with the, the way children are wired, it's very impressive to hear that a, a child that young is understanding the concept of sacrifice or mm. uh, delayed gratification because that's essentially what that comes down to is she knows that in her mind, the temporary pain is not outweighed by the long lasting satisfaction of having her mm -hmm. ears pierced. So mm -hmm. that's really, really mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She, uh, yeah. I mean, that, she's like that in a lot of ways, you know, she, um, like in gymnastics, she excels in a lot of things. You know, she, she did gymnastics and ballet since she was three years old and she's really good in both of them. She's like competing in ballet right now. Uh, sorry. No, she's competing in modern dance and jazz since last year, 2019, um, when she was six and, and, uh, she's very good. And, and people, my, my friends, like, like, you know, I say she's very good because, you know, it sounds like I'm being biased, but other people, <laughs> when they see her dance with another group of girls that are similar age, they're like, wow, she's very good. She's like on point and she's into it and she's not afraid of being on stage. Whereas the other girls are more like, you know, hesitant, reluctant. They're looking at the teacher for like the moves and, and they're also shy on stage. Well, my daughter's like out there. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> she's undaunted. And, uh, and she enjoys, uh, the hard work. So, and, you know, with chess too, she's, she, she got really good, uh, because my son was, was better than her for a while. And then she decided that she wanted to get good. So she kept asking him, let's play, let's play, let's play. Even though she was losing every single time, she was like, no, let's play again. Let's play again. Let's play again. And then finally she started winning and now they're about equal. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's it's amazing and like you know she loves going to chess tournaments uh with me my, my son is so much different so different than her in that he doesn't exactly um enjoy competition um like tournaments and um yeah he's more um yeah he he says he doesn't want to play games where somebody loses whereas she has no problem like monopoly or chess or going to competitions he loves that um just, and um yeah and so they're very different personalities you know and um yeah and, and it amazes me and, and that's what um you know for me what what um homeschooling can bring out in a child is uh you know you can see their different personalities and you can cater to their different personalities right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there's also and, and also as well respecting their um, personal desires of uh pursuing that which they're interested in like like um the fact that we're homeschooling allows us to do all these things whereas if they did go to government school not only would they be robbed of the time 
that they're at school, but they will also be robbed of the time when they get home to do homework. They have to do homework for school. <laughs> so, so how much time does that actually leave for them to do what they actually want to do? And at the same time, spend time with family. You know, it's like so much time is robbed um, by the state and government school. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. And it's, you know, I really like what you said there about, you know, homeschooling, you're able to really uh, notice the different personalities in your children and then be able to, to cater to each one of those, you know, um, you know, like I noticed with my son, you know, for example, like he's as an astrologer, that's useful. That's one of the very first things I did, you know, was, uh, you know, create, create his birth chart. And that's been really useful for me, uh, in kind of gauging how, how he likes that, but you know, he's, he's a Virgo and his like favorite thing is to just, he likes to organize things all the time, like for fun, like he'll take this little stack of toys and he'll take them like one by one and then stack them up over here. You know, and I'll, I'll have right here right now. He's really big into dinosaurs, you know, like he's always going around roaring around the house, but uh, <laughs> I'll have these little stacks of dinosaurs like all over, like on my desk or like in the pantry, you know, and they're just kind of randomly everywhere. But uh, he, he doesn't really like it if you un or like he has a certain vision in his mind of a way he wants it organized and doesn't nice. like anyone messing that up. Logan's laughing because he's forgot to do. He understands. So, and I think this is the funniest thing, you know, so, you know, so I just kind of like let, let it's like, okay, yeah, I've got a couple dinosaurs on my desk. And I, you know, if he's wanting to just, he's just having fun organizing things and, you know, he's got a vision in his mind, but I just let him do that. Cause I understand that's kind of his disposition and that that's what he's going to enjoy doing. That's him learning how to develop those skills in that part of his personality. So I can, I can just, you know, get, give a little more room and leeway there and just understand I'm, I'm going to have dinosaurs all over the house, you know? <laughs> right. I was also laughing because I was imagining him seeing like this masterpiece, like, you know, like the, the beautiful mind thing. And then you just see like this total pile of chaos. <laughs> yeah, like, like dad comes in and just messes it up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I just think it's, it's beautiful to, to dive into these topics because, um, and I'm, I've, I love that we're getting into this. We haven't touched on this uh, as, as like in a focused way as much as I would like on this show because it's, it's so uh, important. And what I mean by this is, is the principles of anarchism, voluntarism. And what I'm getting at here is that with, with an episode like this where we're, we're speaking with Danilo and he's just a very uh, well-rounded, intelligent, and heart-centered man that just wants the best for the world, for you know, his family and everything. And, and that's really what I want to say is that is what freedom is. That's what anarchy is. It's not, you know, people with, with masks and Molotov cocktails. It's people that want to raise beautiful, intelligent and productive children and, and you know, let uh, industry thrive through free, free trade, free markets and things like that. I mean, that's what, you know, it, growing your own food and sustainability and things like that. That's the picture that we're trying to paint of what it, what it truly means. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, when I first created my website, uh, peace, um, back in like 2014, 2013, um, my wife was very nervous about using the word anarchism in the title. And mm -hmm. so that's why I was very, uh, intentional in using in putting peaceful peaceful anarchism very important <laughs> you know um, because uh, when I tell people that yeah anarchism is peaceful and people don't understand they, they get confused you know so um, it's amazing how um, you know statism the statism that we were all raised in um, has uh, deeply inculcated this idea that anarchism is chaos and disorder and uh, and it even is in I think is in the dictionary when you look up the word anarchy, it is one of the definitions chaos and disorder, um, right. and it's amazing how how they have you know it's our, it, the associations of those two things are very deep, and so that's one of the things that we have to um, you know illuminate is no it's not <laughs> it's you know basically mm -hmm. what what anarchists are are just people that don't want rulers you know don't want masters and then of course. Um, they get confused with the idea. Oh, so you don't like hierarchy? No, 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 no. <laughs> you yeah. know, you know, like like being a, the president of a chess club is different than being being the president of the United States. <laughs> it's a big difference. Yeah, you know, you know yeah, uh, exactly. when when chess clubs can print their own money and they can wage 
violent wars against other chess clubs. Okay, then you might have a case of comparing chess clubs to states. <laughs> Until then, no, they're not the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hierarchies are, are a natural system of order that organizes things. Uh, it, the, to me, the difference being is you can opt out if you want. If you don't like the chess club or you don't like the way an architect is building his, his project, you don't, no one's forcing you. You know, that's the thing. You can opt out as opposed to, you know, governments, taxes, governors, all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I, I really have a fun time um, talking to people about these concepts because um, there's so much, there's so much misunderstanding mm -hmm. um, and, and false like, assumptions. Yeah. And the circles that, that I, the circles that I run in um, the homeschooling uh, families that I run in, um, tend to be a lot of uh, women who are Bernie supporters, Bernie Sanders supporters, and they love socialism and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, tend to be green, eco, <laughs> environmentally friendly type yes. people as well. <laughs> there is a lot of overlap with the anarchist mindset and then the sort of uh, new agey kind of hippie-ish, uh, you know, that it's a, it's a similar energy of just kind of like remove the structures of, you know, the patriarchy, if you will, that, that, that mentality, it's kind of similar, even though they're, they're different. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. T feminists as well. <laughs> some, mm -hmm. some feminists, some social justice warriors have uh, crept into our groups, although they, they, uh, they don't really, um, how do you say, uh, jive well with us. And so, yeah, they, they've left, but um, yeah, I've gotten into some pretty heated debates with some feminists, um, even though I'm not the type of guy to um you know to to start a conflict or start a or start a debate I don't, I, I don't like debating people i just i just find that it's very um unproductive you know it's like somebody is so passionate in what they believe and nothing i say will change them so mm -hmm. you know better i educate people you know passively through my videos through my podcast also just through how i parent my kids you know and um and also uh, i i was uh, telling logan that i um uh, i want to start a um, economics uh, course based on the Tuttle Twins books. Um, uh, are you familiar, uh, Logan, with the Tuttle Twins books? I'm not. Connor Boyack. Um, he's a um, he's a he's an anarchist, and he wrote uh, you know free market guy, a, a capitalist, and he wrote uh, these Tuttle Twins books, TuttleTwins.com, and uh, they're basically children's books targeted uh, t for ages five to ten. Mm. And great illustrations, um, and also, and so he he hires someone for the illustrations. He writes the storyline, and so it's basically these Tuttle twins, and they go through adventures, and and it's all about educating kids about uh, free markets, about spontaneous order, about capitalism, about you know what is um, what is statism basically, uh, what is morality, um, um, what is law. Um, what is theft? And, uh, and then he talks about central banking, the Federal Reserve, inflation, monetary creation. Um, and then they talk about also entrepreneurship, business, economics, um, also government school versus homeschooling. So a lot of different topics. And, and they're wonderful because um, there's really a, um, a, a dearth of information of this type of, uh, of these type of concepts targeted to that age group, five to, five to ten. You know, and so he found that there was a, a gap there, and so he filled it, and and there's their wild success. You know, he's and it's not only in the homeschooling community he's a success, but it's in um, also um, kids going to government schools and parents who want to teach their kids these things, and and so yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. And so and so I bought, you know, he made ten books so far. Uh, actually, no, he made he just he just released his eleventh book, and um, and I want to create courses either in person or online um, based on these, based on these books. And, um, and I've already done one, one um, um, like discussion with a, with a group of older kids. Like the kids are like um, um, seven to 10 years old boys. And it was wonderful discussion. You know, we were talking about, and I, and I, and I was very careful. Like I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to, um, tell them what I think. I didn't want to give them the answers. I wanted them to arrive at them on their own. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would ask them what, you know, what is government? What do you think the government is? Right. Um, and uh, what is the law? 
what do you think the law is, right? Mm-hmm. And we started talking about what is morality? How do you know what's moral? How do you know what's right and wrong, right? Is it based on the law or is it based on something else, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And, and then the idea of legality does not equal morality, right? So um, if, if, you know, if it's um, illegal to, um, to rob or to assault or to kill, if the government one day says we're going to do away with that law, does that make it okay to rob, assault, and kill? And they mm-hmm. say no. Ah, so then, so then, <laughs> it doesn't come from, the, it doesn't come from the state, right? You know, this understanding right. of morality. Um, and then I mentioned also, um, you know, Jim Crow laws as an example of, as an obvious example of, of how, yeah, what is legal is not necessarily moral at all. Mm-hmm. You know, it can never be used as a as a yardstick for morality. So mm-hmm. it was a very productive conversation, a very great conversation, and. Uh, if I do another one, when I do another one, I want to record it and, uh, and start posting on my YouTube channel because I think they're so valuable conversations awesome. to hear, hear kids talk about this stuff, you know? Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that's, that's one of my goals <laughs> right now. Yeah, that sounds like, that sounds like a great idea, you know? And, and that's the, uh, a great thing too is I think a lot of parents, you know, they think the, the, their only option is to send their children to the public school system, you know, like because they – they might be busy, you know, with work or between jobs, you know, like raising a family uh, these days is definitely not, not cheap by any means. Um, and they don't actually realize how many resources are out there to actually help, uh, you know, uh, homeschooling parents or like different get togethers with groups or, you know, people uh, like yourself who uh, could be creating online courses that, you know, you could, they could have access to that could help teach certain concepts. Uh, but I really think you being able to use the internet and utilize things like online courses and that anarchists are taking the time to design education that actually teaches uh, about freedom and, you know, uh, how economics goes, you know, hand in hand uh, with that. Those are really uh, uh, great resources that I think we'll see more and more of them continue to come out uh, and be developed and and grow as, as more people, you know, shift into uh, finding those, I think we'll, we'll kind of see a lot more people moving away from the public school system, which, you know, we already do see to, you know, to some extent for sure. There, there are a lot of parents out there very interested in keeping their kids out of, you know, the public indoctrination camps, you know, uh, for sure. Hmm. So Danilo, um, obviously there's a, a very strong theme here going about, you know, conscious parenting and teaching kids uh, those those fundamental principles. Um, what is your uh, commentary on like the the systemic breakdown of the family unit and and what what value that intrinsically has and why the state would be threatened by that and seeking to erode? Yeah, um, yeah, breakdown of the family unit. Yeah, I think that's that's one. Um, one effect of, uh, of government schools is to, uh, yeah, is to definitely break down the family unit because, um, you know, it reminds me of a quote by Malcolm X, which is, um, uh, never let your, your enemy teach your children, right? Well, Something I just like posted that. that. I just posted a meme with that like last week. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorites. Um, and it makes sense, you know, um, you know, I, I, I've known people that said that, uh, they, they said, I know, all the stuff they teach in, in government school is garbage. But when they go to school and then they come home and then I, I, they tell me what they learned and then I, I try to um, reverse all that and try to show them how it's all wrong. And I'm like, wow, that's very exhausting <laughs> to do that. You got to do that every single day. Mm-hmm. Like, it's like your kids come home with like a mess of like charger cables and you have to just like untangle them all. Like, <laughs> Oh God, what is this? <laughs> oh my God. I can't imagine doing that. That's such a, that's such a burden to, uh, mm-hmm. to foist upon yourself, you know? Um, yeah. So, so I just find it to be so much more um, convenient and beneficial for the kids uh, to just, you know, just homeschool and just, um, it's not, by the way, it's not easy to homeschool because, um, one parent, uh, one parent has to stay home with the kids and one parent has to work. So it's a single income situation. Right. And it's not easy. It's hard. You know, I, I understand people who, who can't do it. They say because of financial reasons, um, 
but uh, you know, you make your choices in life for what you think is important. You prioritize for what mm-hmm. you think is important, and you make sacrifices. You know, like we have okay. definitely sacrificed for our kids. You know, it's it's amazing how when we um, talk to people who don't have kids and and uh, <laughs> you know the the things that they can do you know on a whim you know i don't know go to the movies or go on to a you know go to vacation or whatever <laughs> and, take and a nap like, <laughs> yeah. say again what is it yeah he said take a nap T- oh take a nap yeah I said, take a nap <laughs> yeah 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 so i mean it's amazing what people can do yeah who don't have kids um but uh you know we it's like a, an investment into the future. That's, that's what you're doing. When you're raising kids, you're pouring resources into this child and you want, you know, this child to grow up and be, a, you know, an intelligent and uh, productive and uh, compassionate, loving uh, member of society, you know, and, and so it's, it's definitely an investment for the future. So that's how we look at it. So, I mean, I try to help my wife with income and everything and teach my chess classes, but it's definitely, difficult we've made difficult choices and uh but but you know i I don't think we would do anything different um at this point and um yeah so that's one way that uh yeah the family unit broken up you know another way would definitely be like welfare you know the welfare state um Mm -hmm. encouraging people to not stay together right and it gives the wrong incentives to people especially you know giving um giving parents money to uh you know just for having kids You know, like, like we live in an area where there's a lot of Hasidic Jews, right? And so they have a lot of kids and they take full advantage of the welfare state. (laughs) They get money per child, right? Um, A a lot of money. And um, I'm not really sure how exactly they do it because they have like, they have like a mother and father. So they're not like single income people and yeah i don't know i mean they're 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 not they don't they're not poor either like they like you understand people on welfare they're like living in maybe housing projects or the ghettos or you know really low income housing these people don't don't do that yet they get money i'm, I'm sure it has to do something with their religion they get money through the state per child and i'm, I'm thinking and then everybody's like resentful of the hasidic jews for like you know populating expanding taking over taking over counties taking over the board of education you know the schools and you know, because uh, they're very like inclusive. They don't, uh, or sorry, no, what you, oh, exclusive, right? They don't allow people into their community. They're very um, tight knit. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I made a video, um, a short video rant about how it's not their fault. It's not the fault of the of the Hasidic Jews. You know, they're not the enemy. No, the enemy is the incentives that they are merely responding to, right? If you give if you give money to somebody. Um, you know, free money to somebody just for having kids. Guess what? You're going to have more kids. <laughs> you know, people respond to incentives. You know, that's exactly, exactly why they say don't feed the animals in a park, right? The animals will come back and they will stop. Um, they will stop trying to fend for themselves and they'll, they'll just expect free food, free stuff constantly. So people respond to incentives. So it, you can't blame the people for responding to the incentives, the perverted, distorted incentives that the state has, has, uh, erected. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, you know, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's good to, that you noted that, uh, homeschooling can definitely be a difficult process for a, a lot of parents out there. Cause it does bring you down to that, or it can bring you down to that single income. But again, I think just like where it could help, uh, in the education of children and homeschooling, uh, as well as using the internet and, you know, modern technologies and things we have as parents, Uh, you know, where, you know, there's a lot of people kind of moving into that digital nomad lifestyle. Well, that's really kind of what I've also been working on creating for myself, because it it also allows me to uh, stay home, you know, because I work from home, but I'm also the one that watches my, my son most of the time when, you know, because his mother, you know, she works at, you know, uh, like UPS, you know, she has a regular job where she goes and works for someone else. So me being able to use the internet and work from home and do consultations allows me to still have my career and bring an income, but at at the same time also be there to, uh, you know, help, help with my son and everything. And he's not at the, the age that we're doing school, you know, he just turned two. So, you know, we're still in very early stages, but, you know, we're mostly playing all the time and stuff like that. But as he, you know, gets older, I definitely, in working to have that established where I can, you know, make sure to do both things. 
Um, so that, you know, that's, uh, I think, something that we could, you know, see a lot of parents maybe moving towards the, those options or, you know, ha are, are not even maybe even aware that those are the kind of options that you can do that you can actually start building a career uh, doing things online or whatever that it allows you to be there with your children as well as uh, get the work done that you need to for your career. Mm -hmm. So it seems like uh, based on what you were saying that it, it comes down to the education is, is sort of that, that the nucleus of that equation in terms of the erosion of the family unit uh, so that the kids are forced into school. You know, the government is manipulating the markets, making things expensive, gas prices, all this good stuff, so that both parents uh, have to work, or it's a lot harder to only have one working. And then you have things like feminism, the ideology itself that, well, you know, okay, the husband could support, but I, I'm not going to let that happen just as a matter of principle. I'm going to work too because I have a vagina and, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to prove something. And then the, the state is indoctrinating your children. And then they're, you know, the next generation is that much more far removed. So you can kind of look at the, the opposite direction of that being the crux of society. And then community is, is like the next level, like the extension of that family. It's, it's like the family's families, you know, there it's just more uh, emergent layers of organization, voluntary, peaceful, mutually beneficial cooperation, which is just what everybody really wants to be doing. If we could just be left the hell alone for once, but um yeah, would you like to weigh in on kind of like the importance of community and, and other ways that that even further strengthens this, you know, it takes a tribe to raise a child kind of uh, idea? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, one thing that um, people have the idea, the misconception about homeschooling is that it's a solitary endeavor. You know, it's like you're, you just, I, I just, you just throw your kid in a room, throw books at him and lock the door. <laughs> <laughs> That's what homeschooling is. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I tell them we're barely in the house. <laughs> like we mm -hmm. do a lot of things. We, we, um, you know, I teach my chess classes. I, I take my daughter to gymnastics, to ballet, to dance, to my son does fencing. We go, um, we just, we, we have play dates. We meet up with other families. We, we do a lot of stuff. Like my kids wish that we would stay home more. <laughs> they long to stay home more. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, not only should you, yeah, not only is it bad, you should not, you should, you should make sure that you meet up and find other families that are doing, uh, that are home, either homeschooling or just, you know, are critical of government schooling. Mm -hmm. Because if you try to do this alone, you will definitely be, um, you'll be run down. You'll be exhausted. Um, it's not, it's not a, yeah, it's not something you do on your own homeschooling. You have to mm -hmm. find a community. You have to find a tribe. I mean, I'm a, I'm a volunteer. I'm an anarchist. I'm a free market um, capitalist. Uh, I can safely say that nobody in my group of people that we regularly hang out with fulfills all of those criteria, <laughs> yeah. but that doesn't mean I still can't hang out with them and be friends with them. You know, they're cool people. Mm -hmm. And you know, they, um, they're, you know, generally anti-state, you know, not to the point of anarchism, but they're generally critical of the state. They're critical of, of public schooling and, and they're all peaceful parents and that's great. And, you know, we get along. I've been friends with these people for like, uh, like, uh, five years now, right? We've been hanging out and we go camping together. So it's like, you know, we're a very close knit uh, group of people. And, um, <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, you definitely don't have to find like carbon copies of yourself in terms of your belief systems. Um, but, uh, you know, it also creates great discussion and, and they've learned about me and they've, I'm sure they've understood over time as, as I've talked about, I mean, I don't preach to them. I don't like try to convert them at all, you know, but they know where I stand on a lot of things. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and slowly over time, they ask me questions and they, they've come to understand certain things. So I think just having them know me, um, will make them feel comfortable with, with terms like anarchism and capitalist right. and, and volunteerism, you know, so, and, and the, the idea of privatizing everything, you know, they, they've slowly come to understand the value of those things um, mm -hmm. without me actually having to, you know, physically teach them, <laughs> you know, and, and point out how wrong they are. No, no, that's not necessary. So 
Like, that's that's kind of how I approach things. You know, you you just be a good person. You know, you you be a hu- you know you be moral and you be compassionate. You be a humane person. You treat people with respect, with kindness, and uh, guess what? They respect you, and they might respect your beliefs as well. You know, whatever mm-hmm. your beliefs are. So, so yeah, okay, career yeah, community that- so valuable. Sorry, go ahead. No, that, that definitely uh, was a striking realization at one point when I was kind of rethinking the whole schooling thing about how uh, it's it's the antithesis to natural law, something we talk about a lot on this channel, where nature, the universe, reality is the teacher, and yet we take kids and put them in this sterilized white room that looks like a prison and, and take them out of life to try to teach them about life it just makes absolutely no sense but um yeah i mean it 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 does go even beyond the education aspect because yes you're you're kind of raising children together collectively and you're learning to respect each other's beliefs and this kind of thing but also there's more accountability in communities which makes the police obsolete or you know not not needed and um and then you got bartering and trade, which is, is good for everyone. It's the more of that and just mu- mutually beneficial interaction is really what it's coming down to, that it's voluntary is always better. It's always more fruitful and, and productive for everyone. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think uh, uh, another big issue of what, what we can see, uh, especially now uh, in like states like New York, a lot of parents are, that weren't looking at homeschooling before are now considering it uh, specifically in context to the vaccination issue of, you know, public schools that not only is it now a forced education and controlled mind, but they're now, you know, then laying claim over, you know, the, the, the physical body, even more than just telling you that your children have to be here at this, you know, at this time for sure, you know, like they already have that, but then it's, you know, getting into the, realm of forced medical interventions and i know that's a that's a big area that is kind of pushing a lot of parents to then look at the homeschooling option would you like to get into that oh yeah definitely that's um that's been in the news uh lately a lot over here uh where i am in new york and new jersey we live in new jersey but we're very close to new york and rockland county um that's where i go that's where our friends are it's where a lot of their my kids classes are um And so since last year, uh, June 13th, last year, 2019, that's when uh, the religious exemption for vaccines was done away with in New York. Um, And it caused a big, uh, a big outcry, big backlash from people. Um, A lot of people protesting, you know, going to the Capitol, Albany, um, you know, online protesting, everything. And then a couple of months later, they, they, um, they did away with the uh, medical exemption for vaccines. So now there's, and this is for government and private schools. So now there's absolutely no way for you to send your kid to any school whatsoever uh, without getting vaccinated. So now that has forced a large number of families to do homeschooling if, if they really, so it really, what it does is it tests the resolve of, of parents in how seriously they consider or how seriously harmful they consider the idea of forced vaccinations. You know, if some parents are like, you know, yeah, I don't like it, you know, I'll do an exemption. But, but some parents are like, well, you know, look at the pros and cons. And I, and, you know, I want to work. I still want to work and my, and I have my, my, my spouse work. So I value that. And so now you're going to get vaccinated so you can still go to school, you know? So it's really tested people at how firmly they, they are principled in this idea. And so all of my friends, my close friends, uh, they're, they're like me in, in the sense that they don't vaccinate and they're very strongly principled. Um, and so they have all been forced, except one. One is a, or she was already a homeschooler. But the other ones, they all sent their kids to a private school. And, um, and, then they, and then the law changed and then they're forced to homeschool. So now we're all homeschooling mm-hmm. since last year in uh, September. Uh, my sister also, she wasn't, um, she wasn't vaccinating um, by the way, my sister is not a volunteer, it's not an anarchist in any way. Um, and she doesn't, she's not a homeschooler either. Um, but she didn't, she, she did not vaccinate, which is one thing that we did agree upon. And, um, and though, and so she was put in that position of choosing. And so she chose to vaccinate her kids. Um, you know, she, it was a very difficult decision for her. She was like crying a lot and just, you know, staying up worrying and all this stuff, but she did it. And, uh, yeah, so it's very sad. And, and, um, and, you know, my wife is getting very involved in it on Facebook and, following uh, different people like Del Bigtree 
uh, who are big into the, uh, you know, the anti-vaccination community. And, uh, and so there were a bunch of protests, one happening in Trenton, uh, which is the capital of New Jersey. And uh, my wife wanted me to go, but, um, you know, for the longest time, I, um, I don't really, I don't really recommend protesting for people. I, I don't, I don't like the idea of protesting because number one, it's like we're begging our masters for a longer leash. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and number two, it's dangerous because a lot of violence tends to occur in when large groups of people get together that are very angry and emotional. You know, that's when you get police in riot gear and, you know, the big buses, prison buses, and people get thrown in, in there. It's just, it's just not a recipe for... <laughs> uh, it's well, not first a recipe. It's- First, it's recipe. police in, in, in street clothes being provocateurs and actually ah, turning yeah, peaceful yeah. protests into yeah. violent ones, and then right. the other police come in and right. do the stormtrooper thing or whatever. But, right. Yeah, I mean, the whole vaccination thing is just, to me, just yet another example, a, a proof of the government believing that they own your body and they have the right to tell you what you can and can't do with it. And it just amazes me that people don't see how dangerous this is that anything to do with, you know, like this coronavirus scare and, and you know, vaccinations, it's, there, it, it's such a weak point, you could say, uh, where they're trying to slip in and, you know, control people and be complete tyrants for the sake of public safety. It's just, it's so dangerous. And I wish people understood that the government has killed so many more people than any virus, even the bubonic plague. I mean, <laughs> come on now, like just look at statistics. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So, if people yeah. if people understood statistics, they would never be afraid. Okay, <laughs> they mm-hmm. would never be afraid of anything that the media is trying to tell you to be afraid of. If, if people understood stuff like that, mm-hmm. um, but uh, what was I going to say? The coronavirus. Yeah, you know, um, I uh, I'm a I used to do stand up comedy. And uh, I'm a big proponent of using comedy to convey difficult messages. Oh, you know, yes. I, love, uh, I love Bill Hicks. I love George Carlin. I love, um, um, what's the guy's name? Bill Burr. You know, there's mm-hmm. a lot of comedians that, that state truths in a very, um, you know, unfiltered. Digestible. Funny, yeah, digestible, yes. funny way. And that's awesome. That's great. I love that. You know, so when I, when I talk about these things, you know, these <laughs> concepts that we're talking about when, you know, like capitalism and free markets and trade, I mean, they seem innocuous, but most people would, would recoil and, and think they're like, you know, horrible and dangerous and anarchism, you know, especially. Um, but if we can convey these topics, and this is what I try to do is convey them in a very, uh, you know, in, in a lighthearted, uh, humorous way. So when I post stuff on Facebook, you know, if I, if I write something, you know, when I, my writing is very serious. My writing is not humorous, but when I post a, a cartoon or a meme, I try to make it lighthearted and, 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 you know, something they can laugh at, like a cartoon. That's why I love cartoons, you know, yeah. uh, especially political cartoons. So, so if we can convey these messages and get people to laugh at the same time, mm-hmm. that's, that's a success, right? So like with this coronavirus, I mean, I mean, anything you can think of with the state, the state is founded in fear. That's the foundation of, of, power is fear right yeah. so if we can get people to laugh at authority at those in power Ooh. that's they, we've already stripped them of one of their most powerful tools of mind control what you guys are saying Ooh, so right. so like for example this coronavirus massive fear-based propaganda massive right mm-hmm. so um <laughs> like i joke about it all the time with those around me you know i'm you know people are like um uh, uh, you know people are like coughing or something and i I'm like, did you just get back from China or something? Like right. That? You know, like I've been, like, I've been cracking jokes with my my Uber rides because I've been driving Uber and stuff, and you know, <laughs> people are coming from Walmart and stuff, and I'm like, you know, like everybody's having a party in the toilet paper section. I was like, you know, uh, I'll bring the Corona, you bring the virus, and they were like dying. <laughs> yeah. Well, that you know, uh, you you really hit the nail on the head there when you say that that laughter really strips them of that power. I mean, it, if mm-hmm. you're even thinking about it, you know, from a physiological level, there's uh, fear is you know dealt with in the in the reptilian part of the brain, 
Uh, whereas like laughter, that's a lot, that's a lot higher of a brain function. So if you can get people to laugh, you're immediately bringing them out of that state of fear. You're bringing them into a, a, mm-hmm. a higher state of awareness. And that's also a, it's such a useful tool to be able to transmute uh, yes. potentially difficult messages uh, in a way that like, as you were saying, is very digestible and even beyond that enjoyable. That's mm-hmm. it. Laughter is such a it's, useful tool for observing the shadow, uh, you know, not only in like our own life and personal shadow work, but, you know, looking at things in, in society in general. You know, I think that's why comedians have such an important mm-hmm. uh, kind of place in society. They're like they're that, al- that release valve wizards. for the shadow. Yeah, they're exactly. alchemical wizards that are transmuting that fear into awareness and, you know, mm-hmm. you know, that higher vibration, like you said. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think uh, comedians can be the unsung heroes because they provide that social commentary, but they have that weird sort of immunity, like the court jester that can make a joke that can top mm-hmm. the kingdom. Like you've said, uh, Brian, mm-hmm. they they wield such power. Like people mm-hmm. like yeah. J.P. Sears too. I'm a big fan of. Oh right, yeah, like he's it. so good at framing <laughs> things. He he just t- destroys it. It's it's absolutely amazing. I love that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, and I was just gonna mention about comedy. How? Yeah, you're right. It's it's so powerful. Alchemical wizard. I love that phrase. I love that. That's really great. Um, and and you know the the idea of restricting um speech right now, right? Mm. And restricting Jeez. what people can say, especially comedians. And you know when uh, so I used to do comedy, right? Stand up comedy in man clubs in Manhattan and Long Island, and. Wow. And I loved being around comedians. It was such a wonderful opportunity, such a wonderful experience because, you know, it's like it, it, being at a comedy club, it's like everybody's there for one reason, right? To laugh, to be entertained, you know? And it's yeah. awesome. I love it. And just being around comedians, like they laugh at each other so much, you know, like I remember being at this one comedy club and, and so the comedians that were not performing were in the back of the room. Uh, and then you know, in front of us was the audience, and then the, and then the, and then the comedian, and then and so we were watching our 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 fellow comedians go up there and do their thing, and and sometimes when a comedian bombs and the audience does not laugh, that's when comedians laugh. They laugh, <laughs> <laughs> they laugh at the comedian for bombing. <laughs> it's the funniest thing. So we're like constantly, constantly, uh, you know, riffing and making fun of each other, which is great. I mean, it's it's just such a, such a wonderful atmosphere. And and so this idea of restricting what comedians can say, you know, hate speech and mm-hmm. and uh, and that's so unfortunate because the role of a comedian is, you know, what's really what makes something funny is pushing the envelope of an acceptable opinion. You know, if you can <laughs> only comedians can they can talk about something on the fringes of what we would consider taboo. And that's really what makes it funny. Like if they say things that everybody considers acceptable, that's not funny. <laughs> you know, that's not what right. comedy exactly. is, exactly. you know? So once you begin to restrict uh, the content of what comedians can say, you, you are destroying comedy. You're destroying, you know, free speech mm. and, and what it means to be funny. And so, and so it's so, so unfortunate. And, and it's really telling actually how the state tries to do that and so to me, it, it may, may be indicative of the state's fear that comedy is actually, you know, disarming their power. Absolutely. Right. <clears throat> right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry. Well, yeah, it's such a, it's a very powerful, you know, uh, magical tool if you, if you want to look at it from that perspective. Uh, and I would say that even beyond, uh, if they're restricting free speech, even beyond just destroying comedy, that, that could be, it's destroying human consciousness. Mm-hmm. Like you were saying, uh, comedians, where they dwell in the realm of the fringe, you know, you're pushing the edge, you're pushing the boundaries, you know, you're, you're laughing at the, the shadow of society that everybody thinks about, but other people are too afraid to say that, you know, that's how you can really grow. Or even in, if people were too afraid to ever look at any of the issues or, or things like that, and then they just went ignored that it would just keep us in a smaller and smaller box. If you have a, a comedian who's out there, who is then pushing those boundaries that's then getting people to think of new perspectives or can like mm. you just talked about JP Sears. He's great at that. He pushes those boundaries. It's an expansion of human consciousness mm. using the tool of humor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, hu- comedy humor to me is just truth with a twist. It's, it's like you just kind of mm. exaggerate it or push it a little bit out to the edge 
and then it, it it strikes a chord in such a way it's it's so fascinating to to think about right. that right? yeah um so yeah i think uh i think that's probably uh pretty good grounds we've covered here you know a, mm -hmm. a painting a very nice picture of what uh an actually truly free society could look like it's not you know explosions and chaos and looting and whatnot it's just people that want to be left alone so that they can thrive and prosper and uh, grow their families and, and live in abundance. Um, so quite the contrary to what the powers that be and, and the media and things like that would want you to believe about this. And, and it makes sense why such a, such a thing would be a, a threat to the status quo. So, um, I, I think that regardless of what they're trying to do and all these antics that they're doing, we're just moving that direction and there's really nothing that they can do to stop it. They can just try to delay the inevitable as much as they can, but there's just, there's no stopping the power of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I tell people that, um, you know, when I tell them my YouTube channel, peaceful anarchism, and then they have this, you know, confused look on their faces about the word <laughs> anarchism. That, then I say, look at, look at me. Okay. I'm, I'm a, we're, we're, we're a homeschooling family. We're in a single income. I bring my kids to gymnastics, ballet, tap, dance, fencing. Do you really think that I want disorder and chaos in the world by me being an anarchist? Do you seriously think that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like, just look at my life, how I have structured my life. That, that's, that doesn't, it doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense, you know, when you think about it like that. Um, and, and I love the idea of um, there's this, um, I guess it's like a... Uh, like a syllogism, which is, um, you know, if, if, every, if every person, if all human beings are good, then we don't need rulers. Rulers would be, you know, absurd or irre irrelevant, right? If all people are bad, then, you know, having a ruler rulers wouldn't, wouldn't really change them at all, right? If some people, if a small amount of people were good and a large amount of people were bad, right, then the evil people would be attracted to positions of power to rule over the smaller people, or they can just dominate them through voting, right, and mm -hmm. impose their, their will on them through the state. If a large group of people were bad and small pe people, oh, sorry, the other way, if a large group of people were good and a small group of people were bad, again, the evil people would be attracted to government to wield their evil over the large group of good people. So mm -hmm. in either situation, <laughs> the state only makes things worse, <laughs> Yes, mm -hmm. that's a, that's a great way to tie that all together for sure. And I'm, I'm mm -hmm. so thrilled that we were able to, you know, revisit these ideas and again, put this in the minds of our audience because it is so fundamentally important in that our central mission is self-empowerment, sovereignty, and you simply cannot have that with a violent, destructive institution called the state out there ruling people's lives. It, it cannot coexist. So thank you so much, Danilo, for uh, joining us today. It's been a, a really awesome uh, conversation. So there's nothing left to do but tell the people where they can find you and what you're up to. Yeah, thanks a lot for the, uh, for the conversation as well. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so I'm on YouTube. Um, just type in Peaceful Anarchism. You should find me um, in the search bar. And then my, uh, my, pe uh, my podcast is also Peaceful Anarchism. Find that probably on any podcatcher um, app like uh, Stitcher or iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Um, yeah, I'm also on Steemit, on, on D Live. Well, actually, I don't, I don't really, or D D Tube, I think it's called. Uh, but I don't, I don't post there much because it's kind of got glitchy. Um, uh, what else? Um, yeah, I got a Patreon page, and uh, if people want to donate to my stuff. You know, I, I, I don't do as much uh, interviews lately, but I still do the uh, short five to 10 minute video rants on various topics. Um, lately, I did a, a, a couple of videos on uh, space and how, because I, I, I went down to um, Florida with my family in, um, in September. We went to Disney for the first time. I'd never been to Disney ever. And uh, I mean, we only went to Disney because it was like a gift from my sister-in-law for my kids for their birthdays. And so that's the only reason we went. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to afford it because it's so expensive. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, going, you know, the, the, the plane ticket down there, you know, how much the ticket is just to get into Disney. And then if yeah. you want to buy any extra, oh my God, so, so expensive. Um, yeah. yeah, but it was a very interesting experience. Right. And, uh, and what we also did while we were down there was go to Cape Canaveral and visit the, uh, visit that place. And, um, 
and I, I never been there and um, I was overwhelmed with all the statism and all the hero worship and military worship down there. Mm. Oh my God. It's amazing how, mm-hmm. how, and you know, I, I guess I didn't realize it to the extent that I did when I went there, but yeah, the, the only people that were really considered seriously to be astronauts are people in the military and the Marines, you know, in the army and the air force. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I did a couple of videos on <clears throat> and how I thought the U S space program was a, you know, one giant boondoggle and military worship and, you know, only really exists, um, because of nation states and their desire to wage war against one another. And, you know, and, um, you know, I'm sure it would happen, you know, I don't know how quickly it would have happened without the state, but if it was, if it, if there was, if there's some way that it, it would be, um, economically productive for entrepreneurs to, to, um, you know, go into space and maybe con- try to colonize and explore other planets, it would have happened if, if, it, if, you know, people like Elon Musk, could find ways to make it profitable. But, um, but yeah, <laughs> sorry. Sorry for going on that rant, but yeah, that's what I've been talking about recently. So, so yeah, I'm all over, I'm still on Facebook, I'm on Twitter and, uh, yeah. We'll put all those links down there too, as well. Cool. But, uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Love it, man. Love it. So that's all we have for you folks. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. We'd really love to have you. And, uh, you know, hit the like button as well. Help us pop up in the algorithms and all that good stuff. Check out our website, uh, thewizardfactory.com. And until next week, be empowered, inspired, and encouraged.